You know how they like to censor movies on re-release? You know, like changing the guns to walkie-talkies in E.T. Removing a single frame showing Jessica Rabbit's crotch in Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And totally pretending Song of the South never even existed? Well, they've only gone and done that to games too now. With the recent rise in popularity of retro gaming, and publishers owning decades of long neglected IPs, it's an extremely quick and profitable way for them to make some extra moolah. However, as you're about to see with your human eyeballs, publishers' over-neurotic attempts at not wanting to trigger even the most thinly skin of triggerables has left some very bizarre and questionable edits to our childhood. So, this episode, we take a look at these attempts to nerf nostalgia, these undertakings to obliterate the old school, and these exertions to permutate the past. As I say, but hello you. I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt. Four cases of idiotic modern censorship of retro games. But before we start, don't forget to click that subscribe button as well as the notification bell to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. And away we go! <laughs> Alongside titles such as eSWAT and Toki, Shadow Dancer The Secret of Shinobi was another of Sega's attempts to use the name of a popular arcade game but to make a completely different experience out of it. And an excellent job they did of it too. The Secret of Shinobi is far superior to the arcade original, which in all honesty is just a rehash of the original Shinobi, just now with Extra Dog, as evident with it being re-released multiple times on future 16-bit compilations. However, with the release of 2018 Sega Mega Drive classics, or Sega Genesis Classics if you're in America, collection for the PS4, Xbox One and Nintendo Switch, Sega, completely out of nowhere, decided to censor the World Trade Center from the game's title screen. However, rather than remove the buildings entirely, they simply just reuse one of the sprites again and place it in the middle of the two towers to make it look like one wide skyscraper. Possibly to make it look like the MetLife building, who knows? But a big black square on the title screen looks ridiculous now. On a thematic level, the game is set in 1997, when the towers were still standing. And going out of your way to pretend the buildings never existed is far more disrespectful to the victims who tragically lost their lives that day than to honour them by leaving them intact. And want to hear the most stupid thing about this whole piece of unnecessary censorship? Sega didn't even bother being thorough with their suppression, as the Twin Towers still appear in the game's ending completely unedited. So fantastic job being consistent with your completely unwarranted editing of history there, Sega. Bravo! Simulations of pinball machines in video gaming, especially in the early years, have always been a difficult task to perfect. And while very few have managed to accurately computerise the haptic feel of whacking a metal ball with some flippers, such as DICE's Pinball Fantasy Trilogy on home computers, the first on console was arguably Natsak's Crush series. When Alien Crush and its sequel, Devil's Crush, were released on the Turbo Graphics, gamers instantly fell in love with its impressive visuals, dark adult themes, and ultimately how it managed to both emulate the accuracy of a pinball machine, but at the same time take advantage of it being a video game. So the series instantly became a cult classic, and later on, an obvious choice for a re-release when Turbo Graphics titles started to appear on the Wii Virtual Console. However, while NEC were more than happy to allow Devil Crush's satanic imagery to slide on their console, Nintendo were not. Bizarrely, for a game that contains flayed skulls, exploding baby heads, and twatting giant steel balls against druids, 
Nintendo's main objection to the game were the spinning pentagrams. To have the game acceptable on the virtual console, all pentagrams in the game were changed to spinning triangles instead. Which is odd as a pentagram is just two triangles on top of each other anyway. But some genius at Nintendo thought this strange request for censorship would be just enough to stop the younglings worshipping the Lord of the Underworld. You know, you've become really picky with your choice of restrictions since the days of Mortal Kombat, Ninty. What's wrong with you? Now, here's a bizarre turn up for the books, as it's actually a game released on one of those plug and play systems. You know, those bloody things that still insist on looking like complete arse by using mono composite leads instead of HDMI in the 2020s. Anyhow, when MSI Entertainment decided to release a retro plug and play of a WWF game, they not only wait for what is considered one of the lesser games in the NES library, WrestleMania Steel Cage Challenge, but also not even the best port of the game. The Master System version is far superior. But eagle-eyed retro gaming and wrestling fans noticed, aside from the logo rebranding and slapping Jim Helwig on the title screen, two of the original lineup had been removed. Hulk Hogan and the Mountie had been replaced by the Ultimate Warrior and Razor Ramon. Coincidentally, this wasn't the first time the Ultimate Warrior was rushed in to replace another wrestler in a WWF game. The same thing happened with the Skronking one replacing Jeff Jarrett at the last minute in the PS1 and Sega Saturn title, WWF In Your House. Now, the Mountie is a bit of a mystery why he was taken out, but at an educated guess, the WWE considered him one of their more forgettable wrestlers to modern day fans. That or they just hate French Canadians. But the Hulkster's absence is certainly far more cut and paste. Are you your own racist? No, Hogan. Back in 2015, a video was leaked recorded eight years prior of Hogan objecting to his daughter having relationships with gentlemen of a differing skin pigmentation to that of his own. Not that there are too many orange people in this world. However, quite clearly screaming the N-word several times throughout caught the ire of the WWE, whom immediately fired Hogan as a result. In fact, simply sacking the guy just wasn't enough for the WWE. Since that incident, they have Chris Benoit him from all posts on their website, searches on their streaming service, and all of their future video games. So ask yourself, is removing an 8-bit sprite from a three-decade-old video game actually censorship? Well, the WWE and MSI Entertainment wanted him purged from the game so hard, they decided to replace him with another racist, albeit one that's dead, and a murderer. So, you come to your own conclusions. Should we all be racist now? What's the official line Hulkamania is taking on us? You know, for a title that's been rated the greatest game of all time, Nintendo have really gotten cold feet with Ocarina of Time over the years, censoring and re-censoring the game multiple times with stupid and overly neurotic edits. Even just weeks after Ocarina of Time's initial release, the game saw not one, but two reissues. The first saw some game crashing glitches fixed, but 1.2 saw the first piece of censorship with blood being removed. Strange considering Ganondorf is the only enemy that actually does bleed within the game. But I guess, being a pig demon, he must phlebotomise apple sauce in Nintendo's family-friendly eyes. Version 1.2 also saw the beginning of Ninty fearing they might offend someone. For example, the theme to the Fire Temple area featured a backing track containing Islamic chanting, with verses such as, There is no other god but Allah. In the 
in the programmer's defense, they obviously had absolutely no clue what the lyrics actually meant. They simply lifted them from a stock music CD, as they felt they sounded fitting to the level. Though strangely, the exact same track is also heard in the game Cruising World. And that passed the Nintendo censorship policy completely unscathed. However, this piece of censorship was such a rush job, rather than compose an all new track for the area, they just reused the Shadow Temple thing, but added a few extra beats to the song to disguise the fact. The next revision came when Ocarina of Time was released on the GameCube. Nintendo felt there was content in their game which still may be considered offensive to Muslims this time feeling that the Gerudo symbol looks a little too close to an Islamic crescent. So changed, what they thought, were all symbols in the game to an alternate Gerudo symbol found on a background tile in the then recently released Majora's Mask. Now, of course, you're probably muttering to yourself, the Nintendo 64 and GameCube aren't modern consoles, Larry. Why are they on this list? Well, that's where we come to the 3DS port of the game. Not only did Nintendo screw up the last piece of censorship, realising they hadn't removed all of the crescents within the game, for example, in the ceiling of Dampe's tomb, but the most neurotic piece of censorship of all was with the design changes to the Lost Woods inhabitant, Skull Kid. For some unbeknownst reason, Nintendo suddenly thought Skull Kid's face hidden within shadow was now considered him being in blackface so redesigned him to make him look like he had a coconut for a head, which, come to think of it, is technically almost as racist. But going by Nintendo's definition, that would also make other shadowed characters such as Orko from He-Man, the Jawas from Star Wars, Gigi from Final Fantasy, and even Tao Kaka from Blaze Blue, blackface too. Now I understand Nintendo wanting to appeal to as many people as possible, but turning into a nanny state with paranoid bouts of censorship has to have a line drawn somewhere. Hello you! Thanks ever so much for watching! Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified, and be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time. Ta-ra for now.